Uh, hello, this is Mike Billington. I'm with the uh, I'm the co-editor of the Executive Intelligence Review, uh, representing the Schiller Institute and the LaRouche Organization. Here today with Colonel Richard Black, Senator Richard Black, uh, who after serving for 31 years in the Marines and in the Army, uh, then served in the Virginia House of Delegates from 1998 to 2006, and in the Virginia Senate from 2012 to 2020. Uh, I'll allow Colonel Black to uh, describe his military service uh, himself. Um, uh, Colonel Black, in my interview with you uh, on April 26th, which focused on the difference between the US and the Russian military operations in Syria and also in Ukraine, uh, that now has nearly 3 million views, a million in English, over half a million in uh, Russia with Russian subtitles and many, many other languages. Uh, and with thousands of comments, mostly of the nature of uh, high praise for a military veteran telling the truth about the extreme danger of the failed US leadership, which is driving the world towards global war, perhaps even nuclear war. Um, so you have a very large following around the world. Uh, perhaps that is one of the reasons that you are uh, one of the 72 people who were placed on the blacklist published uh, on July 14th by the Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation, which of course means censorship board or, or ministry of truth, you could say, uh, which was set up by the US State Department and the US and British intelligence uh, in Kiev uh, to label any challenge to the narrative about military operations in Ukraine as Russian propaganda, even calling the people on the list information terrorists and war criminals, uh, i.e. you. Um, so what is your view of this? Well, let me, let me start, if I could, uh, by just giving our listeners a little bit of my background. Uh, I want to make it very clear that I love my country. I've risked my life for it hundreds of times. Uh, I volunteered to fight in Vietnam. I was a helicopter pilot, flew 269 combat missions, and uh, my helicopter was hit by enemy ground fire on four of those flights. Um, in one case, uh, bullets that were aimed directly at me uh, tore through the cowling of the cockpit uh, just, just behind my head. Uh, so they very nearly hit me. Um, I was flying off the carrier Iwo Jima in the South China Sea off the coast of the Philippines when there was a flight operations uh, officer who briefed us in the morning. He said, he said uh, our squadron's been tasked with providing uh, one volunteer to fight on the ground with the 1st Marine Division, which was at the time heavily engaged in combat. And uh, I immediately volunteered, uh, went to work with the 1st Marine Division, uh, fought uh, in 70 bloody combat patrols. And during my final patrol, I was wounded. Both my radium men were killed next to me uh, after we had uh, launched a rubber boat assault and crossed the Hoi An River under enemy fire. Uh, I went on, I served a total of 32 years in uniform, first as a Marine pilot, then as an Army lawyer. Uh, I ran legal offices at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, at Fort Ord, California, at Fort Lewis, Washington. <clears throat> in each of those, I served, supervised 25 to 40 Army lawyers. Finally, I retired as Chief of the Criminal Law Division at the Pentagon where I testified before Congress. I advised the Senate Armed Services Committee and prepared executive orders that were signed for the signed by the president. So that said, I am adamantly opposed to our current wars and especially the very dangerous war that we, we've engaged in in Ukraine. Uh, I believe the US, the UK and, and the European Union have embarked on an imprudent course of action that has carried a significant risk of triggering an all-out nuclear war. Now, 
Moving on to the issue of the, uh, the Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation. It's very interesting. Uh, this, uh, this woman, uh, uh, Nina Jankowicz, uh, created quite a, quite a media frenzy when uh, it was discovered that, uh, that the Department of Homeland Security was going to set up a disinformation board, a ministry of truth to decide which versions of, of facts would be permissible and which ones would be censored. So this was censorship at the very highest levels of the federal government. And um, uh, when, when it came out that she, Nina, Nina Jankowicz is a rather bizarre young narcissistic woman uh, with a, an extensive background of working within the Ukrainian system and informing those people about how to control so-called disinformation. Um, now, she was President Biden's pick uh, to be the director of the Department of Homeland Security's new disinformation governance board. Uh, and the literally the sole purpose of that board was to censor critics of uh, government policies. Um, now, this, this is a woman who supposedly is, is going to make things more truthful by suppressing voices like yours and mine. Um, it's interesting that uh, she, uh, she issued some tweets that implied that reports about Hunter Biden's laptops were somehow Russian disinformation. Well, uh, I think practically everyone in the country, Democrat and Republic understands that, Republican understands that there is something gravely uh, wrong with uh, with Hunter Biden's laptops and the information that's stored thereon. Um, uh, Jankowicz has said that she shudders to think of what free speech abolitionists would do if Elon Musk loosens the restrictions on free speech imposed by Twitter. In other words, if there is somehow an explosion of freedom in America, uh, she 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 just doesn't know how the world would would deal with the truth. You know the truth is is uh, is quite a danger. So we we do know that she has very close connections with the Ukrainian uh, government, and uh, uh, the the Ukrainian government has set up um, a uh, a disinformation board. Uh, which is essentially a blacklist. And the blacklist contains 72 names, but 30 members uh, who were uh, interviewed uh, by the Schiller Institute, uh, which, which uh, uh, has done some excellent work in keeping people informed about what's going on. Um, but anyway, the, uh, this, this blacklist is clearly intended to instill fear and to, uh, and to silence critics, to censor critics. And so here we have a situation where the Department of Homeland Security has, is giving guidance to the Ukrainian government, to the S, SBU, which is a sort of a terroristic uh, secret police in, uh, in Ukraine telling them how to suppress the voices of American citizens, not only American, there's some, uh, I think an Italian general, I'm not sure who all is on, on the list, but there are a lot of prominent people. And um, so I think we've, we've got a very real problem where we have American taxpayer dollars being spent by the Department of Homeland Security for the purpose of silencing free speech. That's where we stand right now. So as you mentioned, uh, 30 of the people on that list uh, were uh, uh, either leaders uh, or friends 
who uh, of the Schiller Institute, who spoke at, at one of the Schiller Institute conferences. Um, uh, you spoke at several Schiller Institute conferences with Helga Zeppler-Rusch. Um, why do you see, what, what is your sense of why there's this extreme targeting of the Schiller Institute by these uh, Ukrainian forces? I think if you look at the people who have, uh, who have appeared at these various conferences and interviews that, that have been done by Schiller Institute, the, the Schiller Institute and the Executive Intelligence Review publish highly accurate, very balanced foreign policy assessments and also uh, raw intelligence from which people can simply look and see what the media from all different nations is, is saying, including the New York Times, the Washington Post. So you have this uh, aggregation of, of uh, of open source intelligence, which allows people to sift their own to some extent to arrive at their own conclusions. Uh, and I think, I think that the Schiller Institute <clears throat> is viewed as a genuine threat to the new world order, the globalist, the deep state, whatever you want to call them. Um, uh, for them, truth is the ultimate disinformation. You were uh, one of 16 Americans on that hit list uh, who this past week uh, signed a letter to six congressional committees, the Intelligence, Judiciary, and Foreign Affairs Committees in both the House and the Senate, uh, a letter which demands an investigation of, as you said, the use of taxpayer money to finance a foreign entity in Ukraine, which is threatening the right to constitutionally guaranteed free speech of Americans, uh, as well as threatening the personal safety of American citizens, given that we're uh, being, uh, people are accused of being uh, propagandists for Russia with whom Ukraine is at war. And therefore to call us, call these people war criminals and terrorists is clearly a, a threat that something might be done physically. Um, uh, Scott Ritter, a former Marine intelligence officer who's also on the list uh, made the point that when you're dealing with the Ukraine regime, such a list is a kill list. Um, so as both a former military officer who headed the Army's criminal law division and a political leader who served in the Virginia House and Senate, what, what is the impact of this US-sponsored and funded threat on you and others? And what must the Congress do? You know, it's interesting. Uh, at the at the height of the Islamic Caliphate that was set up by the terror group ISIS, uh, I was among three Americans who were named as enemies of ISIS. Uh, ISIS called me the American Crusader, and uh, and that was certainly a hit list. And it, so it's ironic that here we are. And uh, we now have not the infamous terror group ISIS, but we have the Ukrainian government operating probably under the specific direction of the Department of Homeland Security to put me on a target list, uh, which uh, frankly today I think is, is far more dangerous. I think ISIS, ISIS ended up having uh, much more to worry about than and whether I, I liked them or didn't like them. Um, but uh, I, think, I think today the, uh, the hit list published by the, uh, by the Ukrainian government is probably a, a more deadly hit list. Uh, just this week, uh, Daria Dugina, who's the daughter of, a, of an activist, um, uh, a, a pro a pro Russian activist was murdered in Moscow by uh, apparently by a Ukrainian assassin who killed her using a car bomb that exploded under her car, ripping her body to pieces and and uh, burning her to death. Um, 
since the United States has admitted being involved in targeting 13 Russian generals for assassination in Ukraine, um, it is possible that the CIA provided the targeting information to go after this young woman. Apparently, uh, they, they were actually targeting her father. Uh, he's an established uh, uh, pro-Russian, uh, pro-war uh, journalist, and uh, they, they wanted to show that they, they have the ability to go right into Moscow and to, uh, and to carry out a, a mafia-style hit, and so they did it. Uh, I would not be surprised if the CIA provided the targeting information to go after her. It was just a last minute switch of automobiles that caused the daughter to die instead of the father. Uh, so I would, I would agree with uh, Scott Ritter to this extent. Uh, the CIA and the Department of Homeland Security have a common interest in blocking access to the truth about the Ukrainian war. And the SBU, which is the secret intelligence agency of Ukraine, is, is being molded through a series of, of rather violent purges by Zelensky into one of the most ruthless intelligence agencies in history. Uh, it is possible that the SBU could view the Ukraine slash Department of Homeland Security's joint list as some sort of a kill signal uh, authorizing them to go after individuals and attempt to assassinate them. One of the people on the list is uh, Diane Sayer, who is the independent uh, LaRouche candidate for uh, the US Senate uh, in New York State against Chuck Schumer. Chuck Schumer was one of the leading members of the Congress uh, uh, pushing the massive funding of, of the Ukraine uh, government and war, including the Defense Department, which set up this hit list. She's on the hit list running against Chuck Schumer. Uh, so Chuck Schumer is uh, financing uh, a foreign entity, which very possibly is threatening an, a candidate against him. Um, so this, uh, this would appear to be a quite violent intervention into an American election. Do you have some thoughts on that? Well, I, I do know that uh, Diane Sayre is, um, she is on the hit list. Uh, I've actually, I've listened to her discuss this issue uh, on an interview, I believe, with Scott Ritter. Um, I, I would tell you, she is an amazingly bright, informed, uh, articulate, uh, appealing candidate. Uh, I, I just, I can't imagine anyone uh, being a better representative of the American people than Diane Sayre. She, she just, uh, uh, she would certainly have my vote uh, if she were, if she were, if I were, if I were in New York. But in any event, uh, yeah, I think I think she just sort of uh, makes clear what's going on. You know, here we have a, a senatorial candidate, a prominent woman in New York, uh, and you've got uh, Chuck Schumer uh, in a position to uh, where they're, you know, he's funding Homeland Security. Um, I'm sure that he's quite comfortable with the idea of, of a disinformation board, because there's a lot of disinformation about him that he'd like to suppress, you know. Uh, and uh, so, I, you know, it just shows the, the, the darkness and the challenge that uh, the American disinformation board and the Ukrainian disinformation board, uh, the threat that they, they pose to freedom these, these are not instruments of the people. They're not instruments of liberty and freedom. They are instruments of tyranny. These are the kinds of things that the Gestapo, uh, that the Bolsheviks, that the, 
uh, that the, the you know the great tyrannies of the world impose is you know some sort of preclearance on what you can say and what you can't. So yeah, I think uh, I think it's a very very bad sign. The U.S. taxpayers are also uh, funding uh, our uh, Department of Justice, obviously, and the FBI. Uh, and that means they're also financing the raid against the former president's home uh, a few weeks back. Uh, uh, Trump, as everybody knows, was, was impeached uh, for reportedly trying to influence President Zelensky in, in Ukraine to investigate uh, alleged criminal behavior by uh, by President Trump's opponent, Joe Biden, and especially his son, Hunter, as you mentioned. And yet here's, here's Joe Biden raiding the home of his possible opponent in the 2024 presidential election. So what are your thoughts on this raid? The, the raid is, is absolutely outrageous. It, it is amazing. If you, look at, if you look at what happened here, this is an election year stunt. There, there's no justification for it. It is clearly designed. Uh, it was a Hail Mary pass by the Democrats to say, look, let's let's do a, a raid and let's play it up with publicity. And hopefully it'll somehow taint the uh, the Trump campaign for president. As if uh, as a practical matter, what has happened is since the raid occurred, I think the American people are, are waking up and they've said, hey, wait a minute. We just don't go for this idea of raiding your political opponent. Think about this. You know, uh, when Richard Nixon was in the White House, he was overthrown over a third rate political prank at the Watergate. It was a it was a, a break in. It was like Republicans versus Democrats the year prior to Watergate. Uh, or, or the election prior to Watergate, the Democrats had broken in and burglarized the Republican headquarters. Here we were, and the Republicans burglarized the Democratic headquarters, and yet they managed to overthrow the presidency over this. Now you think of, of how trivial that event was relative to conducting an all-out FBI raid on the residence of the president of the United States, the former president. Um, now, <clears throat> if you look at the way that the FBI did it, <clears throat> of course, you know, they've got a, a, a very dark history of this. They did it in a way that was designed for maximum publicity. Uh, they tipped off, the FBI tipped off the news media to when they were gonna be there so that the news media would be able to, to be on the scene. They chose to maximize the visual setting so that they had emergency lights flashing. They had 30 FBI agents swarming all over the place, carrying fully automatic submachine guns in full view. Uh, and you know, Democrats, they hate the, the AR-15, but except when their agents are descending on uh, their political opponents, and then they're big on, on, they don't care whether they use machine guns or mortars or what. Uh, so, so they, this was set up. It was like they, they may have had Hollywood directors telling them how to do it, but it was, uh, I, I'm not saying that for a fact, but, but they thought it through. They thought, how, how can we play this out in the media? And so it was deliberately designed as a media circus. Uh, and uh, now, it, let's let's look at at their their justification for this. Well, they say that uh, that uh, President Trump had some classified papers in some cartons that he took when he left the White House. <clears throat> now, I'll tell you, I I have old documents that I'm going through for the first time now that date back to 1963, and they've sat in dusty containers ever since. So the idea that somehow President Trump, in between his incredible schedule of making appearances, and things, he's going through all these old dusty boxes, I, I'm, I'm, I don't find that too convincing. But here's something that, 
that I think will interest your listeners. Um, Seymour Hirsch is, is probably the finest investigative journalist of our times. Uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize uh, over the My Lai Massacre. Uh, he exposed the situation with the Abu Ghraib uh, prisons. Uh, he, he's just a magnificently talented individual. And he has spent many, many years, apparently while he's writing other books and doing other investigative things, he has been over 30 years now preparing a book called The Dark Side of Camelot. It's a book about, the, about President Kennedy and, and his administration and so forth. In that book, he, uh, he interviews a, uh, a woman uh, and uh, the, the uh, let's see here, the, the woman's name is Suzanne Forbes, uh, a national security archivist at the Kennedy Library. Um, and uh, so she is, she's responsible for maintaining the national security archives that are held by the, by the Kennedy family, essentially, at the Kennedy Library. And uh, she said that when, uh, she said that when the, she's referring to the Eisenhower administration, she said that the Eisenhower administration left virtually none of its national security files behind when it vacated the White House. And that this typically is the case with outgoing presidential administrations. Now reflect on that. Uh, you have national classified holdings today at the Kennedy Library, just as you have in other presidential libraries. So, and, and here you have the, the National Security Archivist at the Kennedy Library saying that this is, this is a typical uh, thing that's done by different outgoing administrations. And she talks specifically about the Eisenhower administration, which had some, some very, very dark secrets in its time. And so the question becomes, well, look, if all of these other presidents take archives when they leave and they, you know, later on they have them and they release them at, at their pleasure from their presidential uh, archives. Um, why does it suddenly become a crime because Donald Trump does it and the deep state doesn't like Donald Trump? I mean, this whole thing is a total fabrication and we've got the Attorney General of the United States working hand in glove with the Biden administration to suddenly uh, create uh, something criminal out of thin air. It, it, it's just a total hoax. And uh, it was an attempt, it was a Hail Mary pass to try to influence the midterm elections and nothing else. Let me switch to the global strategic crisis. Um, in our April 26th interview, you warned very uh, stringently that we're facing the threat of, of global war and even a nuclear war. Uh, and that continues today. The US continues to pour billions of dollars in heavy military hardware into Ukraine. Just last Friday, the Pentagon announced another 775 million in arms shipments, including additional ammunition for the HIMARS systems, the high mobility artillery rocket system, which the spokesman claimed has, quote, really changed the dynamic on the battlefield. What is your professional opinion of that claim and the military situation in general in this ongoing conflict? Well, the HIMARS system uh, appears to be a very effective system. Uh, it, it, the HIMARS fires rockets that are GPS guided, so it's extraordinarily accurate. And uh, however, 
they talk about the high Mars as though it is somehow going to turn the tide of battle. Uh, that there, there is never a particular, a single weapon that turns the tide of battle. Um, the high Mars does make a difference, but it will not be decisive. Now, what we have seen, if you if you look, if you've been watching the war from the beginning, uh, the Ukrainians have they've fought a very fine defensive war. They've you know very tenacious, um, but uh, at the same time, here we are at the six month point, and they have never once launched a significant counteroffensive. They've had limited counterattacks. You know, you, you, can have, you can have a single company that launches a, a counterattack and goes back and forth. But I'm talking about a counteroffensive where they actually make a drive to, to seize territory somewhere. Not a single time have they done that. At the same time, uh, the NATO, the United States had a flood of weapons pouring in to Ukraine. And uh, a great many of those have been destroyed. Uh, many of them are being sold on the black market. Uh, just recently, a very, very good friend of mine, the, uh, the uh, former uh, attache, military attache of the uh, Pakistani embassy, uh, Lieutenant General Ali, one of the core commanders in Pakistan, uh, died in a uh, in a tragic uh, helicopter accident. Uh, there are very strong rumors that he was shot down. Now, <clears throat> the United States has been so loose with control over its anti-aircraft weapons. That those things are literally being sold on the on the dark web, um, so it's it's quite possible that he was shot down either by one of these weapons that was was lost in Afghanistan or perhaps one that's being sold by the Ukrainians. But in any event, uh, there, there's a tremendous uh, bleed off of weapons um, uh, that are being sent to Ukraine and then they're being sold by oligarchs uh, diverted in different ways to terror groups and so forth. So the, the flow of weapons to the Ukrainian army has slowed very dramatically since the beginning of the war. And yet uh, the flow of weapons on the Russian side continues. It's very steady. Uh, Ukraine, people looking at the Ukraine-Russian war uh, are somehow saying, well, look, the, the Russians haven't staged enormous blitzkriegs. But it, you have to realize that the eastern part of Ukraine is heavily industrialized. <clears throat> so what they're really doing is they're fighting urbanized combat on a very massive regional scale. And you don't do that with some sudden rush. It's not as though you're going off across uh, empty planes, uh, you know, rolling your tanks uh, uh, like might have happened uh, sometimes in the Second World War. It is, it is urban combat. It's very, very difficult, very brutal. And yet the Russians continuously move forward and they are inflicting enormous, just a terrible number of casualties on the Ukrainians. Um, I'm confident that nothing will be done to achieve peace before the midterms, because uh, there's no way that the United States is going to allow Zelensky to to talk peace with the Russians. But uh, I hope that uh, I hope that uh, they will do it, because I hate to see these young Ukrainian men being slaughtered. They're, I mean, they're just being used as as uh, cannon fodder. Uh, for the Russians, and it, it's also that the West can can achieve certain political gains and, and sell weapons and so forth. Well, in particular, General Lloyd Austin uh, and uh, 
uh, and Secretary Tony Blinken were in Kiev uh, at the, actually at the same time as our previous interview in April. And Austin said at that point, we want to see Russia weakened to the degree that it can't do the kind of things that it has done in invading Ukraine. Now, this is not, uh, not a military policy. This is a geopolitical mission to destroy Russia and its people through the massive sanction policy, as well as the uh, proxy war in Ukraine. What do you think about this? And, and is the effort to destroy Russia working? You know, when, when we first went in there, there was all sorts of, of uh, excited talk about, uh, you know, from the president on down about how we were going to we were going to turn the ruble into dust. We would destroy it. Uh, we would we would impose sanctions that like nobody had ever seen, and we would just we would just cut off Russia, and, and they would they would all starve or whatever. <clears throat> and we we have moved to do everything that we claim we would do, but the fact of the matter is that um, there was an initial sort of a shock wave in Russia. The the ruble initially declined. Um, there was, you know, there was a, a sudden outflow of capital, a momentary outflow. The, uh, the Russian central bank uh, moved quite aggressively, very effectively to limit capital outflows, to devise ways to work around the sanctions. The, the ruble today, is at a seven year high. Uh, during the, the time since the invasion, <clears throat> the, uh, the ruble has become the, the world's strongest single currency in terms of, of its appreciation against other currencies. So instead of being turned to dust, it has become much stronger than any other currency. Uh, part of this comes from the fact that uh, that Russia uh, has heavy gold reserves and very low debt, unlike the United States, which prints money on a whim. Um, Russia has to follow budgets, and they they don't spend money that they don't have. So it's given them tremendous financial resiliency. As far as the sanctions were concerned, uh, the the Russian balance of trade is now triple what it was before the war. And uh, the reason for this is that they have found alternative uh, markets for their oil. They're selling to China. They're selling to India. They're selling to Japan. They're even selling to Turkey, uh, which is part of one of the NATO countries. Uh, so they're, they're selling oil all around the world. They're selling all of their commodities. They, they do it at a heavily discounted price, but they produce them at a low price. They're making lots of profits. So, you know, it's interesting how the media talks about, well, there's a recession gonna, gonna hit them. Uh, and uh, they, they call, uh, Putin a dictator, even though he's he's elected, he's in, elected in fairly fair elections uh, relative to our own, and uh, uh, they call him a. I guess he's an elected dictator, but then they they always acknowledge that he is reluctant to declare full mobilization because the people might not like it. So he is far more responsive to the Russian people than our government is to our people. So this idea that he's somehow a dictator, I don't think he's a dictator. I think he is, he is a duly elected uh, 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 representative of the, the government. But in any event, no, the effort to destroy Russia has failed. And now as we approach the winter, there is uh, a growing sense of panic in Europe that they have, you know, Russia didn't impose sanctions. The U.S. imposed sanctions, and the U.S. forced the EU to impose sanctions. 
Who do the sanctions hurt? They hurt Europe more than anybody else. They hurt the United States somewhat, but we have really allowed, we've, we've really just thrown Europe under the bus because they depend on the Russian gas, oil, commodities. So no, it has not worked. We have a parallel situation now developing in Asia. Uh, and as you know, Nancy Pelosi, who's third in line to the presidency, mm -hmm. recently visited Taiwan, even though um, uh, President Biden had a phone call with President Xi Jinping just days before the trip. And, and President Xi Jinping called on uh, Biden to stop it. He said, you're playing with fire. And he said, those who play with fire will perish by fire. And Biden even said publicly that the military was advising uh, uh, Pelosi not to go, although that might have been just uh, him saying it. Uh, but it appears that the same military industrial forces who launched the surrogate war against Russia in Ukraine want to do the same thing with Taiwan, that they're trying to force China to act militarily to defend their sovereignty and then blame them and impose massive sanctions and, and decoupling uh, on China as they have with Russia. So what, what is your view of the whole Asia ploy here? You know, th this whole... This whole thing about Taiwan <clears throat> has been a concoction of the U.S. State Department. <clears throat> if, the, if the United States were not constantly uh, sh putting a sharp stick in the eye of the Chinese, uh, things would be quiet around the, the Taiwan issue. Um, the United States recognized long ago that there was one China and that Beijing was the seat of government for one China. But we did it in a, a very delicate way um, that, that sort of preserved some autonomy for, for Taiwan. We didn't officially recognize their government, but unofficially there was sort of an acknowledgement that uh, you know, that we, we saw some legitimacy to it. There's a very delicate balance. Um, Henry Kissinger has recently spoken about, I know he's not one of your favorites, he's not one of mine, but, but as he grows old, he said a few things that were accurate. And one is he's, he's been rather distraught about how cavalier we have been in, in upsetting this very delicate balance. And he, as he said, and I agree with him, that the one China policy uh, that was established by Richard Nixon, I think generally acknowledged as one of his great achievements, it has preserved peace uh, in that region for 50 years. Uh, it's it's uh, enhanced trade enormously. I, I tended to agree with President Trump that we needed to renegotiate some things on the trade scene, but it didn't mean that we had to, to become hostile. And I don't think President Trump intended any hostility toward, toward China. I think he just intended to try to, uh, uh, to gain a little bit of advantage for American firms. And I didn't disagree with that. But what you see with with the the deep state, and it's not even President Biden. Now Biden has not he has not been good on China, but at the same time he he at least had the sense to recognize that what Pelosi was doing as her swan song. I don't know what she gets out of it personally, but she obviously hopes for something because you know she's going to be out of office uh, after November. Because um, she she will almost certainly step down when the Republicans take over. So what is it? What motivated her to make this extremely provocative visit? The Chinese were forced, and she knew it. She was forcing the Chinese to react in some way, and fortunately, they've done it in a in a balanced way uh, that was. Uh, probably the minimum of what they could have reasonably done. They've done a little bit of show of force of 
flying aircraft and ships and that kind of thing. But we always run the risk that something that like, like what Pelosi's done or one of these very provocative movements of ships, something that we do triggers an inordinate response. And somehow we, we're relying on the maturity and the good judgment of people in China to prevent some catastrophe from happening. And, and at the same time, we're allowing ourselves to take the most reckless, provocative steps and, and totally in reliance on their, their good judgment over on the other side. It's, it's not, not wise. Uh, you may have seen that Susan Glasser and Peter Baker, who were two of the leading journalistic promoters of uh, the regime change wars around the world. They've never seen a war they didn't like. Uh, they recently published an article in The New Yorker uh, about General Mark Milley, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under Trump and is still, still so today. Uh, and the book is called Inside, or the article is called Inside the War Between Trump and His Generals. And they report that Milley opposed Donald Trump, his commander in chief, uh, on many fronts, but especially on Trump's orders to end the endless wars in Afghanistan and, and in Syria. Uh, and they, of course, support Milley in rejecting those orders. We got to continue the wars. But Milley is still chairman of the Joint Chiefs. You've strongly criticized him in the past. Uh, so in, in your professional view, um, what, uh, what constant, well, what do you think about what, what is going on there with the, um, the, the top officers of our country? Well, first of all, the, the article, uh, which is called Inside the War Between Trump and His Generals by in the New Yorker. It is a very, very interesting article. You have to read it understanding the enormous bias and prejudice of the, of the two people who wrote the, the article. They obviously have no concept of self-governance, of the, of the right of the people to govern themselves. Uh, they, they seem to think of the American public as a bunch of buffoons who need to be uh, governed by, by uh, an unaccountable elite, which unfortunately is the case. Now, <clears throat> when President, was, President Trump was elected, he, he had no governmental experience. His greatest single failing was that he selected a cabinet and he selected general officers who literally despised him and disagreed with every policy that he had campaigned on and promised the American people. Now keep in mind, the American people elected him because of those policies, not because they, they liked his style. Well, some of them did probably like his style, but, uh, but they liked his policies. They liked his foreign policy among other things. And, uh, but unfortunately, Trump, Trump was sort of enamored by people with Ivy League degrees, with generals who had lots of stars on their shoulders. He didn't realize the cultural change that took place under Clinton, Obama, now, now under, continues under Biden, where we no longer have the, the great American patriots uh, in, the, in the Pentagon and the State Department. Uh, we now have people who, who are very disdainful of the American people. They have sort of a contempt and, and a hatred for the people that they govern. And as you read this article, you see that within the national security establishment, Department of State, uh, the uh, CIA, the FBI, there, there was just quite a contempt for, uh, for, uh, for, a government of the people. And uh, one, one of the things here, um, <clears throat> a comment by the, by the author, author uh, of this article, and they said, uh, yet the constitution offered no practical guide 
for a general faced with a rogue president. Now, it, if that doesn't tell you something about the way that the elites look at our system of government, how can the president be a rogue president? He's the highest elected official in the, la in the land. <clears throat> he is the person who is entrusted by the public with carrying out their will. How can he be a rogue president? I think all of the people who are impose, opposing him were rogue generals, rogue cabinet officials. Um, this this Mark Milley, uh, he, uh, he he's made some rather bizarre statements. Uh, one of them is uh, after after January sixth, when we had the demonstrations at the at the Capitol. Um, he calls together the the uh, members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he makes this bizarre statement. He says, uh, "He says this is a Reichstag moment, the moment of the Führer." This man is a histrionic buffoon. He is a dangerous individual who truly is a threat to the uh, to the Constitution. Uh, that kind of that kind of bizarre type of uh, type of reaction. We've we've seen the same thing when he's testified before the uh, U.S. Senate, and he's commented about why we are teaching critical race theory uh, in our uh, service academies. And he he made this angry statement. He said he said I want to read critical race theory or something like this. I, I want to read this critical race theory so that I'll understand white rage. Well, if you hate white soldiers, then get out of the uniform. Get the heck out of there. You have no business there. White rage, this isn't white rage. The, the January 6th demonstrations had about 900,000 people in the nation's capital, and they were a cut of Americana. They were black. They were white, they were Asian, they were Hispanic, and they were almost in, in the same proportions as the entire country. I mean, there were plenty of, of all of these. It wasn't a, a token here and there. There were lots of blacks, lots of Asians, lots of Hispanic, lots of whites. It was a mix of America rising up not to overthrow the Constitution, but to ensure that the Constitution was followed and was not overthrown. And it was not a violent re revolution. There wasn't a single person caught in the Capitol with a weapon. The only person who was killed, who was deliberately killed in that uh, January 6th was killed by an officer, an agent, working for Nancy Pelosi, who gunned down an unarmed woman who was who had no arms, had nothing. She and without warning, he just shot her through the neck and killed her. That was the only killing that took place on that day. And so um, anyway, I, I've sort of gone off on a tangent, but um, uh, but uh, we we see in General Milley and we've seen it in others. Three times the president ordered uh, that we remove U.S. troops from uh, from Syria. The, when he when he ordered it done uh, and, and just gave a blank uh, a, a, a no nonsense order, you will withdraw by a date certain. Um, uh, General Mattis, who was the Secretary of Defense at the time resigned in order to throw some chaos into the chain of command. John Bolton, who was the National Security Advisor, flew over to Tel Aviv and announced over there that we were not withdrawing, simply countermanding the order of the President of the United States. And uh, and later on, after uh, after the President had totally reshuffled his cabinet to try to get some loyal people in. He again ordered that uh, that the uh, that Syria, that American troops withdraw from Syria. And uh, again, they just they just simply refused to obey the order. 
so there, there is, there is a danger when you have, when you have a military establishment that is not responsive to the president of the United States, we begin to set ourselves up for a military coup and the imposition of a military dictatorship. And I think the leadership in the Pentagon today uh, is, uh, is inclined in that direction. And I think it's a very dangerous thing. And I'm hoping that uh, whether it's Trump or whether it's someone else, whoever uh, takes over must conduct a, an organized orderly purge of the general officers and replace them with people who are loyal to the, to the Constitution of the United States. That, that, that is absolutely imperative. So if there is any chance of preventing uh, the, the danger that you've uh, indicated now for months of heading into a global war, a global nuclear war perhaps, it would require that the US and Russia and China sit down together, not go to war, but to sit down to resolve all of the global issues that are now confronting mankind in this perfect storm, the rush to war, the hyperinflationary collapse of the dollar-based global financial system, the famine, which is now reaching biblical proportions, according to uh, the head of the World Food Program, the continuing pandemic, and, and more. Uh, the Schiller Institute has announced a conference for September 10th and 11th under the title Inspiring Humanity to Survive the Greatest Crisis in World History. What, in, in your view, is required to move the U.S. off of its uh, suicide course and to join in the necessary deliberations of all nations to find solutions based on the dignity of all nations and all people? I do think that, uh, you know, over the years, uh, there's always a a tendency towards hyperbole that, you know, this and that is the worst thing that we've ever faced and so forth. Um, however, I do believe we have reached a point, particularly during the Biden administration, where the foundations of democracy have been severely weakened and undermined. Um, we have had an election which was highly questionable at best um, and transparently fraudulent at, uh, at another, uh, by another viewpoint. Um, we, we're in a posture where if, if we continue in this direction, it, we, we can see the, uh, the emergence of a, of a censorship state a, a state that no longer recognizes the right to free speech. We see it where government uses, uh, uses private companies like Facebook, Twitter, uh, like the, uh, all, of, all of the internet uh, social media companies. And <clears throat> there is undoubtedly some coordination and um, and a tremendous amount of censorship is emerging, and there is beginning to be a certain level of acceptance of censorship. And uh, so we are at a turning point because <clears throat> right now, through the Schiller Institute, through, through various other outlets, there still is the means of communicating to sort of a policy elite, a group of people who are sufficiently intellectual and sufficiently educated to understand the gravity of where we are. Um, whether th those voices will be silenced if the elections do not go in the right way, uh, I think is, is certainly a, a very genuine question. Now, I don't say this as, a, as some kind of a hardcore Republican. I, I am. I'm, I've been a. I've always voted Republican. Uh, always, uh, you know, very very Republican. But at the same time, I, I have some very grave concerns about elements of the Republican Party that uh, I'm not sure that all of the Republican Party 
is that devoted to freedom and, and uh, liberty. But we've got to win the next two elections. Uh, and we've got to do it in the face of what will undoubtedly be widespread voter fraud. Watch the polls, but don't, people, people must not sit this out and say, well, it's a crooked election. I can't, I can't afford to do it because uh, uh, there's always been a certain level of, of fraud in our elections. Um, we have a long and storied history of voter fraud. Many major elections have been have been decided by voter fraud, and uh, uh, presidential elections certainly have. We know that the Kennedy Nixon election uh, was uh, was rigged. I think that's fairly widely acknowledged today. Um, so we've got to watch the polls, but we've got to get out. We've got to vote, and. The new president, whether it's Trump, whether it's uh, someone else, he has got to nominate and have confirmed a cabinet that is loyal to the American people, loyal to the things that the president campaigned on. If they don't believe in what the president campaigned on, they have no business being there. Why, why does he want voices of dissent? It's one thing to have people say, uh, Mr. President, I don't think it'd be wise to implement your policy this way. I think we should do it in another way. Okay, that's the kind of dissent that's positive. But we have people who simply hate what the president stands for and despise the man personally. Those people have no business in government. Um, it's not supposed to work that way. So he's got to to confirm people who are representative of the American people and not simply beholden to the globalist elites. Uh, we've got to withdraw US forces from Syria, which is a tragic uh, war. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to get out of, of Ukraine. We've got to get out of Somalia. The, we, we, we sent troops into Somalia to start a war in Somalia, you know, intervene in a war in Somalia. They didn't bother to, uh, to explain to people why. It's just some little one paragraph knows, okay, we're sending troops. We're sending troops. We're going to war in countries without even bothering to inform the American people to, to concoct some kind of a justification. It's just, ah, we're going to send them off to war. So we're in Somalia. Why are we occupying Germany 75 years after the war? Why do we still have an occupation force in Germany? Why do we still have an occupation force in Japan? I mean, for goodness sake, these have been our strongest allies. Uh, there's no excuse for that. And it certainly doesn't benefit the American people in any way. Now, I do think one of the one of the most hopeful signs I have seen is that if you if you look at the Supreme Court decisions the, for, from the last term, um, not just singling out this one or that one, but as a whole, there is at least a genuine hope that the the Supreme Court, as it's constituted today, is moving towards a restoration of constitutional governance with the separation of powers, uh, with, uh, with the recognition of the rights of states, uh, with, with the withdrawal of authority from the faceless unelected bureaucrats. And so I think there's a great deal of hope and I think that should inspire Americans because up until now, uh, really since the 50s, since the 1950s, the Americans would have some enormous drive to change the law, and then the Supreme Court would wrap them on the knuckles with a hickory stick and say, you know, get back in line. You know, you, you're not going to have your will through the ballot box. You're going to shut up and, and be in your place. The new Supreme Court, I think, offers some help. We've got to build and enforce a wall on the southern border, and we've got to stop you know, tinkering around with it and say, let's do a little of this and a little of that. I think we need to be prepared to use military force against 
the cartels, which are killing 100,000 people a year. My goodness, in 10 years of the Vietnam War, we only lost 60,000. And that was the last truly bloody war we fought, 60,000. And the cartels kill 100,000. And then when, when President Trump suggested to, uh, I think it was to his chief of staff, he said, well, why don't we, you know, we know where these cartel leaders are. Why don't we just take them out, you know, use missiles, take them out. And apparently the, uh, the uh, chief of staff was just aghast. Oh, my goodness. You would hurt the cartel. The cartels wired in with all these politicians. And they're, they're where all the money comes from. Well, uh, the United States needs to be prepared to take action and not to fly some FBI clowns down and arrest these guys. We have a war going with these cartels across the southern border. We need to take them out. We need to kill them. There is no excuse for these cartels murdering 100,000 people a year in the United States while we sit back and our so-called Department of Defense has all of its troops all over the world, and they're not defending the southern border. They're not defending us against the death of 100,000 people a year in the United States. What the heck use are there if they cannot defend the United States border? Well, I thank you. Uh, we will be circulating this widely. It's a moment of crisis for mankind as a whole. Uh, and I'll repeat that we're organizing for a conference on September 10th and 11th. Uh, and uh, I encourage uh, all of our listeners to, uh, to prepare to, to register for that. And uh, I uh, again, thank you for working with the Schiller Institute for making your voice heard. And, uh, and I thank you very, very much. Do you have well, a final thank you word? Very much. Very, mu very much appreciate what you're doing personally and what the Schiller Institute is doing. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what we would be doing if you were not disseminating the information that you do. So thank you very much for it. Okay, thank you. So long.